Chicago Tribune Roundtable Discussion on Ukraine Crisis, the foreign policy question for Bangladesh, supported by the Royal Norwegian Embassy Taka. At this point in time, the Ukraine war has affected all of us, either directly or indirectly. And as a country such as Bangladesh, we also have to know and to understand the situation, what the foreign policy should be and how it should be designed. That is the reason why we have this important topic to talk about today. We are honored to introduce our dynamic group of panelists here. We have Mohammed Tawhid Hussain, the former Foreign Secretary and Embassy of Bangladesh. Then we have Mr. Kasi Nabil Ahmed, the Member of Parliamentary Standing Committee on Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And last but not the least, Dr. Riyas, uh, Dr. Lailafur Yasmin, Professor of Dhaka University in International Relations. Now I would like to invite today's special guest, Honorable Ambassador of the Royal Norwegian Embassy, His Excellency Espen Richter Svensson, to come to the podium and share the opening remarks. Thank you very much and uh, good morning Excellencies, distinguished guests and welcome to today's round table, although the table is not very round. Um, I have noticed comments uh, in the media recently on the role of diplomats, what they are, what they're supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do. I won't dive into that discussion here but I'll I mention it just in case any of you wonder what I'm doing here in a forum to discuss Bangladeshi foreign policy, present and future. My answer is that uh, we're performing a core task for diplomats, i.e. bringing people together to discuss pressing issues. It's what diplomats always do and always should do. We did something similar uh, in this very, very neighborhood about a year ago uh, in December on the subject of Bangladesh's role as a broad, as a regional and global actor with very good results. Uh, we had uh, broad and insightful discussions from many uh, refreshingly new voices so we wanted to do it again on a relevant subject of today and we're very happy to once again partner with Dhaka Tribune to do this and uh, hopefully we can continue working with them uh, in coming time. Last year we wanted to get COVID over with and get back to normal business. Today the threat of COVID has diminished. Instead we are seeing global structure that we took for granted be disrupted and the whole global trade system in disarray. Core global values anchored in the UN Charter have been blatantly breached and the war, which serves absolutely no meaningful purpose, is causing tremendous suffering and loss right in the middle of the European continent in Ukraine. The war itself, however, is not the subject of today's discussions. Rather, it's the fallout of the war and the new international political landscape that we are here to discuss. What and where is Bangladesh's position in this landscape and how to navigate uh, the waters in these turbulent times. That's what we wanted to look into. Uh, we are extremely pleased to see a very good turnout uh, today and I think I can promise interesting discussions spanning a multitude of perspectives. Like last year, I see many uh, younger people here and I'm looking forward to their views in particular. Also, we have, as has been mentioned already, uh, a very impressive uh, panel of experts that will set the scene for the discussions. Uh, we have mentioned uh, the participants so in the panel, so I won't uh, repeat that, but I just want to say that I will waste no more of your time. I will just say that I'm looking forward to the good discussions, to hear uh, new perspectives, and not least, to also hear from fresh uh, voices. So on that happy note, um, I wish you all welcome and thank you so much again for coming uh, and let's have a wonderful couple of hours together to discuss very pressing issues indeed. Thank you.
Thank you so much for your wonderful remark. Now I would like to introduce today's moderator, Mr. Riaz Ahmed, Executive Editor of Dhaka Tribune, to start the main discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning and welcome everyone once again to this discussion, Ukraine crisis, the foreign policy question for Bangladesh. And this morning, those of you who made it here, we are really thankful to all of you and we are looking forward for a rich discussion that we have a very, as the ambassador said also, impressive panel here. So, and also among the participants here, there are very distinguished people who actually always keeping the track of the global scenario, uh, at the aftermath of the Ukraine conflict situation. So let me once again introduce the three panel members we have here today with me. And let me also share very briefly the flow of the event, how we move forward. We are late by 15 minutes uh, starting the program, but uh, we'll try to finish it in two hours time. And uh, at the very beginning, we'll be hearing from each of the panel members, their views, their observations, their suggestions, recommendations on the issue today. And afterwards, once we, uh, once we hear all the panel members, then we'll open the floor and invite interventions from across the table so that we can also, and that can be any queries or any suggestions or your own observations. Everything is welcome here, but we will try to complete the whole session in two hours time. Uh, let's see how we move forward. The panel members today is, are with me today is Ambassador Mohammad Tohid Hussain, who is the former Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh government, and Kaji Nabil Ahmed, Member of Parliament, is also a member of uh, Jatri Shamshad Committee, the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs Ministry. And also with me today, Dr. Lailufar Yasmin, who teaches international relations at the University of Dhaka. Mm, I welcome all the panel members once again on my behalf. Before I move forward, just to give a little bit of context here, about the Ukraine crisis and its fallout. Uh, I have prepared something very brief. I will read it out. That also not in tautology, just in short, to refresh in our mind, maybe. So when did the conflict begin? It was on 24th of February. So it's ninth month running. Tension was on the rise since Ukrainian dissident Jensky asked U.S. President Joe Biden to let Ukraine join NATO in 2021. This incident angered Moscow, which then responded by massing troops and heavy armaments near Ukraine's border, calling it a training exercise in spring 2021. By December 2021, Russia formally sent a wish list to NATO asking for legally binding guarantee that NATO would give up any military activity in Eastern Europe and Ukraine in return for guaranteed negotiation with the West. The US-led West ruled out the Russian demand to halt NATO's eastward expansion. Multiple Western leaders visited Moscow, and I'm, I'm just fast forwarding from here. If this, this you know, everybody know, knows it already. Just moving to the past, what the latest development is over the last two months. In the past two months, the Russia-Ukraine conflict took a dramatic turn in a lightning counteroffensive. In the past few weeks, Ukrainian forces have retaken large swaths of territories previously occupied by the Russian forces. Some of the notable areas include Chenikiv region in the north, Kharkiv in the northeast, and just last week, Russia decided to pull out its troops from Kherson city making it one of the major retreats from Moscow in southern Ukraine. And 
so on. I am not going any further details on that. Just before I move to first pan panelist of the day, I will tell you one last thing from my side is, as the topic is the foreign policy question for Bangladesh, it is important to note here that so far in over the last nine months, there were at least, if not more, five UN General Assembly resolution on this issue. And Bangladesh voted three times, uh, I mean, uh, Bangladesh abstained from voting for three times and voted two times in favor of Ukraine. Some may argue, of course, that it does not necessarily in favor of Ukraine, maybe in favor of the people of Ukraine, not necessarily the government of Ukraine. This is a subject to interpretation. I'm sure that uh, Professor Leibniz can explain further on this. But I'm just giving the context that UNGA resolution demanding civilian protection and humanitarian access in Ukraine. Uh, this was one of the resolution which Bangladesh abstained. And then uh, another was resolution deploring the aggression committed by Russia against Ukraine that was on March 2 that Bangladesh chose to abstain. And then uh, what's uh, actually UN, uh, the latest one, the last one, November, uh, only in this month, on the 14th, the, there was another resolution that UN General Assembly calling for Russia to pay war reparation to Ukraine, which Bangladesh abstained. So I'm sure that our foreign policy makers and the government have their calculation, have their strategic calculations, observation of the whole scenario, the geopolitics, how it is unfolding, and taking this decision one, one at a time, one at a time. So, Today's discussion, the round table is the main goal is to understand those things and also see that how Bangladesh can move forward on this issue in its future strategy. So at this point of time, without further ado, I will call upon Ambassador Tawhid Hussain to, yeah, you say of your own, but I'm just posing one question to you that is uh, about so far, the Bangladesh foreign policy position on this Ukrainian conflict situation, how to assess that? And do you think that anything went wrong or things were moving fine as far as Bangladesh foreign policy is concerned to this scenario? And what's your suggestion for the future? Thank you. Thank you, Riaz. Um, going straight into the issue, um, Apparently, uh, it looks as if Bangladesh position has been inconsistent. Uh, once you are abstaining, then you are voting for, and then again you are abstaining. Um, but uh, if we uh, go into the details, as uh, Diaz has already indicated, that uh, taking decision on, on the merit of each case, um, I think the last two, meaning the uh, yes voting and the abstention, uh, makes perfect sense. Uh, the yes voting was regarding territorial integrity of a country and going against the UN Charter. If there is some inconsistency, that was between the first one and this one. In fact, the first resolution also had components of this um, territorial integrity. And if Bangladesh had voted for, uh, for the motion uh, on the 5th, could have been that on the 1st also Bangladesh should have or might have voted in favor rather than uh, abstaining. The last one abstention is, is, I think, is justified because it's a question of reparation. Now, you don't put the uh, cart before the horse. Uh, first of all, let the war be either at least coming to a stalemate, if not finished, and then only you can think of whether reparation is, uh, uh, you know, justified or not. Uh, at this moment, uh, talking about uh, reparation, I don't think is no, not of much value. So Bangladesh, by abstaining, I think, uh, did not go against anything. It was, it was okay. Um, <clears throat> as I said, that the first resolution should have been, uh, in my opinion, Bangladesh should have actually 
uh, voted for. Uh, well, uh, several justifications have been uh, made, including from the Prime Minister also. Um, particularly, Prime Minister uh, raised a, an issue uh, quite correctly that uh, Russia had helped us tremendously during our war of liberation, and um, it is uh, difficult to go against Russia directly, so we abstained. Um, there is, of course, one caveat here that uh, it was not really Russia, it was the Soviet Union which, in fact, helped us at the UN during the last phase of our war of liberation. And if we, if, if we go, uh, if we look at it in a broader sense, Ukraine was a part of the Soviet Union, and in that way, Ukraine was also on the side which helped us uh, get over the, these problems. Um, the abstentions there actually tend to amount to support for Russia, in, in my opinion. And we might as well not have done this. But the others, uh, the two other uh, abstentions and one uh, support, which was for humanitarian assistance, I think those are quite consistent with it. Now, what is the issue really for Bangladesh? The issue for Bangladesh is on a theoretical uh, plane. A stronger country uh, changing the map of a weaker neighbor by force. That is the issue here. And when the issue is such, I think the interest of Bangladesh should be to ensure that this does not happen. We are on very friendly terms with India, which is surrounding us on three sides. We are very on very friendly terms with uh, China, which is a close neighbor, although we don't have a border. But that doesn't mean anything. The, uh, the Russians and the Ukrainians are very fast friends <coughs> till, till a few years back. Uh, in fact, the demise of the Soviet Union was brought about by Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus wo working together. But uh, things could change, situation could become different, and on such situations, I think our uh, position on principle should have been the main thing. Any aggression, any forcible change of uh, map, we should, in my opinion, we should go straight against that. And uh, although the General Assembly resolution is not implementable, that is okay, but then I think that we should always be on the side where uh, against whom the aggression is taking place. And that way, I personally feel that uh, while abstaining on issues that are not related to changing of the uh, change of the uh, you know, maps is okay, but when the question of territorial territorial integrity uh, and sovereignty comes, our support should be unequivocal. I'll stop there, and I would prefer more questions and answers <coughs> on this issue. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, for your first uh, initial intervention. I'm sure that uh, we'll uh, hear more from Ambassador Dr. Muhammad Tawhid uh, as the day's proceedings move forward. At this stage, I will invite uh, Kaji Nabil Ahmed, uh, a lawmaker and who also sits in the very important parliamentary standing committee of Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So he must have a very closer look into the uh, Bangladesh foreign office policy uh, as far as the Ukraine evolving situation there is concerned. So from that perspective, I'll uh, invite uh, Kazi Nabil to shed some light on this issue. Good morning. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. And first of all, a uh, very uh, big thanks to uh, Dhaka Tribune and Royal Norwegian Embassy for organizing this very important uh, topical discussion today, which is uh, Ukraine, cr Ukraine crisis for Bangladesh foreign policy question, Ukraine crisis and foreign policy question for Bangladesh. 
and uh, our chair of the discussion today, the executive editor of Dhaka Tribune, Mr. Riaz Ahmed, my uh, distinguished uh, co-panelists, uh, um, Honorable Member of Parliament, uh, Mr. Nahim Razak, uh, Your Excellencies, the High Commissioner of UK and Ambassador of uh, Norway, and all of the distinguished uh, guests and uh, academics and uh, former government officials and uh, journalists, uh, my warm greetings to all of you. First of all, I would like to say uh, we're facing a question right now that is very pertinent and it's affecting all, uh, all of our daily lives. Over here today, our topic of discussion is the foreign policy question of Bangladesh. So we are seeing a conflict that has started from uh, 24th of uh, February uh, 2022, though there is a, a backdrop to that for last one year buildup that our uh, 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 chair has already mentioned and my co-panelists also uh, mentioned as well. But uh, the question for Bangladesh has been um, laid out by my co-panelists regarding the five UN votes already in which two we have voted in favor and three that we have abstained. Uh, I would like to say Bangladesh first of all has to look after its own interests. Bangladesh has its own interest as well and there has been an issue over the last few years of attention building up between uh, the uh, so-called superpowers of the world whether we uh, USA vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia and uh, other countries as well. And Bangladesh uh, is a country that is dependent on uh, all the countries above, whether it's uh, USA, it's Russia, it's Europe, uh, Middle East, we have good relations with everyone. And our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has always said uh, she follows the foreign policy of our father of the nation, Bangladesh Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, with uh, friendship to all and enmity to none. And Bangladesh has tried to maintain cordial relationships with everyone in the world. And our Prime Minister has stated that uh, repeatedly uh, time and time. I would just like to say that we are all coming off this year from two years of pandemic, uh, the uh, COVID pandemic, and that has uh, wreaked havoc on the world's uh, economic uh, situation. And Bangladesh has been no exception, though we have uh, fared better than many other countries uh, than was uh, expected. But the Ukraine-Russia war has now affected almost everybody in the world from higher energy prices, uh, escalation of uh, commodity prices, grain supply, Everything is being now affected and we're going to see as we are seeing already in Europe uh, with uh, deep energy cuts, uh, power outages and other, thing, other issues as well. In Middle East we're going to see like a higher uh, uh, Middle East and North Africa and parts of Afri Africa we're going to see like shortages of food and grain when we're going to see higher price escalations. As we know Russia and Ukraine produce like 30% of the, of the grain that our world consumes. And even uh, if we, any of us who have studied supply chain, even a 5% shortage will lead to like a price escalation that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy throughout the world. And we can also see even just recently uh, OPEC also like cut their production of oil just by a few percentage points to, uh, to keep their prices high as well. I'm mentioning all these other issues besides the Ukraine-Russia because everything, we, we don't live in isolation. We are all socio-economic beings and of all our uh, well-being goes into our inputs of our decision as to how we act in the world. And our Prime Minister has been trying to act uh, uh, consistently to make sure that Bangladesh's interests are uh, safeguarded. And we have uh, uh, voted uh, twice in our uh, UN so far about the, uh, and the last vote, the fourth vote that was done in October regarding the territorial integrity and the, uh, supporting the UN Charter. And I think that pretty much uh, says everything that we need to say, though it might be a slight inconsistent with the first uh, abstention as well. And uh, we have refrained from outright uh, condemning uh, Russia by uh, through our abstentions, but I would like to state, um, as has been uh, discussed, there is a backdrop to this uh, crisis of 24th November, the invasion. There were like uh, tensions building up from last year. And I would just like to point out something else that's slightly missing in the discussion. I do think for this particular uh, crisis to build up, uh, the pandemic is partly to blame as well because there were like lack of communication between higher levels of government. A lot of cues were missed lot of uh, body language, a lot of uh, uh, talks on the sidelines of different conferences were missed and maybe a uh, lot of the positions on both sides got hardened uh, from a lack of communication uh, last year which might have led to a decision that has uh, not been good for uh, anyone uh, involved. But I would like to say that uh, we do realize that uh, Ukraine is a, a country with its own territorial integrity 
it was part of uh, you uh, uh, Soviet Union uh, once upon a time and they were uh, have a lot of commonalities and similarities as neighboring countries tend to do in uh, many parts of the world uh, as well and uh, one of the objectives of uh, Russia has been to uh, stop the expansion of NATO eastward or to the former Soviet Union and if you go back to the 1990s at that point um, the Secretary of State and senior foreign policy uh, advisors at, at that point had made made a pledge that NATO would not be going into the former uh, Warsaw Pact nations or uh, the former USSR. Those uh, commitments have not been kept and over the years, over the decades, this issue has built up of, uh, to some extent of uh, uh, aggrievement on parts of uh, Russia. And if I may point out historically, since we were in October, uh, last month in October, in 1962, uh, U U.S. objected to placing of missiles in um, Cuba as well. That was also a neighboring country of uh, USA. That country was also independent. They had every right to do as they pleased as well. But at that point, the world came to a nuclear catastrophe and almost like uh, one minute to midnight, basically. Uh, that might have gone wrong as well. Thankfully, it did not. But I'm saying this, uh, frankly, because superpowers do lay out some lines, do superpowers do lay out some um, ground rules, what they would except within their what they would term as their like neighborhood i'm not saying whether that's right or wrong i'm saying that's what they are that's what has happened uh, that we have seen before as well and over here russia may have said that they were very uncomfortable with the expansion of nato and in that i would really think that the two years of lack of communication between higher levels of governments on all sides from usa russia europe and other countries or other mediating powers who could be or other uh, transnational bodies like European Union or the um, uh, uh, UN and other bodies, the lack of communication, face-to-face -face meeting has led to a lot of misunderstanding and that has hardened positions on uh, both sides and we see this uh, catastrophe. Right now for Bangladesh, the question is to make sure that we can uh, protect our own uh, uh, economic uh, well-being our needs for our energy, our needs for our commodities, our needs for our grains, the safety of our people. We have 170 million people that we have to look after in this country. And that's, I think, the first and topmost priority for our Honorable Prime Minister. And we're working towards that. I will not go into uh, any more details. I'll, I want to hear the opinions of the rest of the uh, uh, participants over here. But uh, Bangladesh has been trying, and we have voted for the territorial integrity of uh, Ukraine. And I would like to say for Bangladesh, the main question right now is to make sure that this crisis doesn't get any worse and everyone can safeguard their economic well-being and come out of it in some semblance of normalcy within the next few months. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kazi Nabil Ahmed and uh, for providing a very good, uh, I should say the rather going beyond the um, Ukraine, exactly the field level crisis, uh, uh, the giving the broader perspective of the whole scenario and what it means for the world and also how Bangladesh should move forward keeping its own interest um, intact. Uh, I think this will uh, give us a um, better context from where we can move forward with further discussion. Before we uh, move forward to go to the uh, all of your participation. Uh, we should listen to the last panelist of the day, uh, Dr. Uh, Lailufar Yasmin. And um, may I um, ask a question that uh, it's nine months uh, going on and um, uh, how long it will drag on? And <laughs> I know this is a very difficult question to answer. Uh, but also uh, the economic fallout of this conflict situation throughout the world, as uh, Nabil Bhai was t saying that uh, the, it's very important, the Black Sea region is very important for the global food security as well. From that perspective also, can you shed some light? Dr. Lailu Yasmin, uh, Professor of International Relations, University of Dhaka. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Excellencies, and um, 
uh, distinguished participants. Thank you for inviting me here. First of all, I'm not a fortune teller. So <laughs> in international relations, we avoid predicting anything, absolutely. Uh, no, no, no. I, I understand that we all, we, all of us, we want to see an end to this conflict, this crisis. But uh, it's very difficult sitting here. And as uh, Honorable um, MP has pointed out, that lack of communication is something that we uh, hardly paid attention to paid attention to. Um, and uh, another thing is that, that uh, my, you know, uh, as we can see in the title, the Ukraine crisis and in the context of the Ukraine crisis, we are looking at the foreign policy question for Bangladesh. Um, so I, I would uh, sort of uh, point out what are the uh, areas that Bangladesh should look into given the conflict is going on and given that we cannot predict about a timeline when uh, it might end. Um, so let me start by uh, being a, an academic. I would take the privilege of pointing out to uh, s uh, scholars here. Thomas Hobbes, when he talked about international politics, he talks about, he gives us a picture that international politics is full with actors where uh, every actor is holding a spear, the first one to blink gets hit. So in international uh, politics, there is no friend, there is no foe. You have to take care of yourself because you cannot trust anyone. Uh, and then Machiavelli in his, uh, the prince, uh, uh, I mean, I was just writing about it, so the page number is 54. So when danger is far, uh, uh, people will will promise to help you, but when danger is near, they will not know you. That is simply, that's how a prince, a state has to act. So we need to realize that what, what are the at stakes for Bangladesh. So I thought that we'll be presenting for 15 to 20 minutes. That's how I sort of, but I, I guess I'll get just about 10 minutes. So for Bangladesh, um, you know, and another sentence that uh, Honorable MP kind of took out of, you know, it feels like took out of my paper is that foreign policy is not done in isolation. Something that we must have to realize realize that each and every country, they are, uh, you know, compelled to look at what are the immediate factors, what are the factors that are a little bit far, and what are the international factors. So when we talk about what are the foreign policy questions for Bangladesh, considering a conflict is out there, which might be territorially far from us, but which is very near because this, we live in a very interdependent world. Whatever is happening in another part of the world, today or tomorrow it is going to affect us. COVID was a very uh, glaring, um, you know, example of that. So I see that uh, this as a three-level game or from the levels of analysis perspective. At the national level, what are, what are the ways that Bangladesh can, you know, uh, uh, prepare itself for, uh, the, for tackling this conflict as well as any conflict that might brew in the, in, in, um, you know, next um, uh, five years, ten years? And then what are the regional level Bangladesh can uh, deal with this crisis? What, are th what is the condition of the international level that uh, we can see? At the national level, what we I can see that uh, we, we have to look at maintaining Bangladesh's economic stability and Bangladesh's growth. Um, we can see that Bangladesh has emerged as the second largest, um, um, you know, um, uh, fastest growing, uh, second fastest growing economy of South Asia. How can we uh, take up with that, uh, we can keep that memento um, uh, uh, up and also with the issue, with the um, uh, energy issue, um, with, uh, you know, a number of um, um, uh, food issue, food crisis uh, has been mentioned, but you can see uh, the WFP report published uh, about five to six days b before, it argues that how Bangladesh has been able to manage this particular um, crisis and there is no Im immediate threat of, um, you know, facing food crisis here. Uh, let us uh, go back a little bit, um, you know, uh, uh, like a few years back during the COVID, there was this, um, uh, uh, there, there was this, uh, you know, apprehension that Bangladesh might face. Um, the number of, um, you know, food hunger, uh, food hunger people will uh, increase and Bangladesh might face immediate threat but Bangladesh has managed during this period uh, fairly well um, than many other countries and there was no single death caused due to lack of food. This is something we often forget that what happened that uh, we, you know how Bangladesh managed that crisis and how that can be replicated in the coming years. Um, so this is one area that Bangladesh has been able to create its resilience. Um, one other thing we forget that Bangladesh's geopolitical significance. Why are we having this talk here? Want to learn about Bangladesh where you know the rest of the world also wants to learn about Bangladesh's position on this is because Bangladesh has been able to create this unique geopolitical value, unique, unique strategic value, and Bangladesh is often being called now as a rising middle power. This is something you have to understand. A country lying at the mouth of the Bay of Bengal is, is called as the linchpin of uh, you know this region, and Bangladesh can provide access to um, the landlocked countries of Nepal and Bhutan. It can ac uh, provide access to 
northeast India. So this particular geopolitical value, it cannot be diminished. One can, uh, of course, uh, have to see that uh, geopolitical value has both sides. We have India as our neighbor. Uh, you cannot change your neighbor. We have to learn to live with our neighbor. And that while that is a, uh, that is a uh, benefit for us, that has also is sparks. Um, then at the, at the uh, regional level, mm, uh, sorry, at the, at the national level, um, another issue is that Bangladesh is increasingly emerging as an agenda setter, especially the issues that affects its national interest. Remember the you know, um, uh, UNGA resolution on Myanmar. Bangladesh did not immediately, Bangladesh abstained from it. And then Bangladesh, uh, Ms. Rabab Fatema, she wrote it along with you know, other members. And then Bangladesh, in the second UNGA resolution, Bangladesh voted for it because Rohingya's concerns uh, were not uh, put there in the first UNGA resolution. So we have to look at this particular strength that Bangladesh is growing, that often Bangladesh is seen as an undervalued country. And there was a very interesting um, quote that, you know, uh, women are uh, not voiceless, but people are not listening to women. Um, this was said uh, in the side of COP27 that is now going on. So I would rather like to rephrase that Bangladesh is not voiceless, but often Bangladesh's voices are not being heard, not being represented in a proper you know, manner in international media. For example, Washington Post is more interested to talk about Brazil, Argentina, uh, uh, fanatism in Bangladesh, then actually looking at what are the economic sectors, what are the growth, wh how women are changing the face of Bangladesh, wh what are the level of uh, empowerment and what are the level of economic activities. For example, I mean, we have an economist here, eminent economist here, that Bangladesh has been able to uh, grow a circular economy for which when the global supply chain during the COVID was affected, Bangladesh was not affected the way Western countries were because our economy is, is mostly, you know, it, it revolves within and people are, uh, people's entrepreneurship and the, the kind of, you know, ideas that they come up with in the rural area as well as the, you know, urban areas, this is something has often remained unnoticed or undernoticed by people. So here we are talking about creating a value for Bangladesh and of course Bangladesh's foreign policy direction from national perspective is friendship with all allies to none because we, we simply have to look at our economic growth, sustaining economic growth and we cannot take sides. This is something that we have to, we have to be, uh, we have to stress uh, uh, more and more because uh, that is how Bangladesh has come this far. It's the second largest economy uh, of South Asia. How did this happen without having any uh, proper resources, proper, um, you know, um, economic, um, uh, you know, we, we depend on RMG, we depend on manpower export and Bangladesh has been able to uh, create a, a name for itself in only 50 years time. Uh, this, there is something that uh, we, I often think that people are missing and they are not looking at this particular aspect. At the regional level, Bangladesh-India relations, at the regional level, Bangladesh-China relations. Um, a number of articles, you know, uh, ORF published a report uh, just uh, um, uh, November 18, I think, um, uh, on, uh, you know, how Bangladesh's relationship with China may bring uh, possible, uh, you know, debt trap, etc., etc. But we already know that debt trap is a, is a, is a you know, figment of imagination by a number of scholars because it has been debunked by policymakers as well as serious scholars coming from Sri Lanka, coming from America, coming from other parts of the world. Uh, so we, we, uh, we can see that how both India and China can be uh, interesting partners for us um, in uh, building our infrastructure in pro as our you know, largest and second largest trading partner in the region. At the international level, uh, I'll not take much time, at the international level we also have to uh, look at what is uh, the particular, um, you know, uh, particular way international politics is being played out. Uh, we can see a rise of plurilateralism. We can see a rise of millilateralism. Countries are not, uh, you know, depending on larger system of alliance, but they are looking at who are the players in the immediate neighborhood and can help us out. So Bangladesh is being part of a number of millilateral activities. Yes, Bangladesh is the chair of IORA, but at the same time, Bangladesh can benefit cooperating with other Bay of Bengal uh, neighbors. And we have to look at what are the threats that are coming in, in that area. So we have to learn to cooperate with a number of our uh, South Asian uh, uh, re regional sort of uh, countries. And not only that, uh, with um, um, you know, uh, the world uh, hitting 8 billion people now, you can see the next uh, you know, population growth will happen in Africa. So how we can expand our look and how can Bangladesh tap this particular uh, you know, area and build a relationship with African countries
countries because there's a lot of potentials uh, because ba uh, because of Bangladesh's expertise in even peacekeeping operations areas Bangladesh can tap that resources so we have to look at diversifying Bangladesh options so that either you can crisis or any other crisis cannot really compel us to take any size because that's not how Bangladesh operated Bangladesh has operated on the basis of its own strength something that often uh, we forget and this is what I would like to stress over and over again that this foreign policy uh, principle it, it has helped Bangladesh and it will help Bangladesh provided we take cogent calculated steps in future uh, any questions and I have a, had a, a couple of more points but any questions I'll be happy to answer thank you uh, thank thank you dr. Lalifur uh, I'm sure that you have more points uh, to add and yeah, definitely you, will may, you may probably get uh, some ch uh, chances also when some interventions from the audience, uh, particip other participants will uh, come and at that point of view, in response, you can also add those points. At this point, uh, we, with that intervention from the panel, uh, we will move forward to our uh, next phase of today's roundtable where we'll invite uh, the uh, participants uh, sitting in front of us to make their comments, any queries, any observation, but please be, be very brief so that uh, uh, everyone can participate within the stipulated time limit. Uh, I, I see uh, uh, Shamshir Mobin Choudhury raising his hand and also you, sir, so I, I'll come to you next. Thank you. Uh, thanks to <clears throat> Dr. Tribune for organizing this uh, event today. Very timely, extremely topical, and uh, indeed very, very relevant to Bangladesh's foreign policy. Uh, one of the panelists, uh, Ambassador Tohid Hussain, and myself are in an enviable position that having retired from government service, we don't have to lie for the government anymore. Uh, <clears throat> But let me uh, go back to certain basic principles that Father of the Nation Bangabundu had laid down in his speech at the UN General Assembly. It was in September 1974. And he said that the world is divided uh, into two groups, the oppressed and the oppressor. Uh, and we will stand by the side of the oppressed. And it is this that has led us uh, to our sustained, continuous and strong support for the Palestinian cause against apartheid regime in South Africa uh, and a number of other such popular movements. And even in the Vietnam War in 1973, Bongo Mundu was attending the Commonwealth Summit in Jamaica from where he sent a message that we recognize the government, uh, provisional government of North Vietnam which was actually taking a position against a strong country like the United States. But it was based on a value. And that value has not changed. It should not change. Self-interest is one thing, but value is far more fundamental. Now, the word here is aggression. And one can say Russia had a perceived security threat perception, uh, security threat. So it invaded a neighboring country, which he referred to very, very eloquently. And we should have stood on the side of the country that has been aggressed against. Now, in 1990, uh, when Saddam Hussein's Iraq invaded Kuwait, uh, Iraq recognized Bangladesh far before Kuwait did. Iraq was perhaps one of the first Arab countries to have recognized independent Bangladesh. But Bangladesh government took a position against the aggression of Kuwait by Iraq. Not only that, we went even sent military personnel with the Global Alliance to liberate Kuwait from Iraq. That was a position that was supported by all major political forces because it was based on the principle that a smaller neighbor cannot be subjected to military aggression by a bigger neighbor, regardless of what the perceived security threat must, must be. This is where we went against uh, by voting against the first resolution uh, in the United Nations. Although we perhaps made it up by supporting the, the resolution on the pre pre uh, preventing the territorial integrity of Ukraine. 
there is a contradiction between how we voted in the first resolution and how we voted on the on the on the one on the integration. We should have stood on the side of uh, or on uh, against aggression. Aggression against a neighbor can never can never be justified. Even during the Falklands War, and the British High Commissioner is here, we came under immense pressure from the United Kingdom. We did not take a position because we had uh, doubts or questions about where, what is the historical position. Now, uh, at the very beginning, uh, the moderator mentioned that the Ukraine-Russian crisis started in 2022. It goes centuries back. It goes back to the time of Catherine the Great when she tried to Russianize Ukraine, denying that Kievan Rus predates Russia. Then in, between 1930 and 1932, Stalin created an artificial uh, famine in eastern Ukraine, which is now Donbass. Lakhs of Ukrainians died, and that was uh, repopulated by bringing in Russians from Siberia, Vladivostok, and all that. And now Russia says this is the Russian-speaking territory, so it should be part of ours. It's like today Italy saying that Ticino should be part of Italy. Uh, and not Switzerland, because majority of the people in Ticino speaks Italian. So that cannot be justified. Now, I will, uh, what, ha what has been the outcome? Yes, there have been economic suffering, there have been inflation, Western countries, European countries, America, Bangladesh, of course, indeed, suffering immensely from the sanctions. So the sanctions perhaps should have been looked at even a little more carefully, but sanctions hurt those who are not directly involved in the crisis. That is where our Prime Minister made this point very, very effectively and very clearly at the Foreign Service Academy. But on the other side, today Russia actually stands isolated. They could not attend the G20 summit in Bali. They could not attend the APEC summit in Bangkok. They actually avoided them because Mr. Putin was not in a position to face the globe. And that is an indication of where Russia stands today. This is unfortunate because Russia has been uh, a major development partner for Bangladesh. The Rupa nuclear power plant is coming up. We have extensive dealing with Russia and we should make a distinction as Tawhid did between Soviet Union of the 1970s and Russia of today. Totally two different ball game here. Uh, what should now uh, Bangladesh do now that the situation has there and not? And let us look at the resolution passed at the recent G20 summit and at the APEC summit, where the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi played a very, very key role. Although India stood effectively not on the side of Russia, but did not criticize Russia, did not go along with the world. The sentence that Mr. Narendra Modi floated at the final uh, drafting of the resolution, that this is not the time for war, that was a message to Moscow that effectively was a message to Moscow. It was hailed universally. Yes, okay, this is the, because there were different views both in G20 and in the APEC summit. But that is what Bangladesh should ask for strongly. A time is now for peace, lasting, effective peace, and uh, peace that ensures territorial integrity of countries and security of states also. So this is something very, very important. Now the Ukraine war, what has it done? It has brought in traditionally neutral countries like Sweden and Finland into NATO. So the verge of NATO, I don't know, Robert can perhaps tell better where that application stands. And uh, so there has been a global shift there in that case. The last thing where Bangladesh is perhaps more affected than economic wise, the Ukraine war has taken the global focus away from the Rohingya issues. And that is our perhaps one of our biggest losses. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, please, uh, I, I will request uh, everyone to uh, uh, introduce yourself for one more time. I know we almost everyone knows everybody, but this is for the sake of the recording that we are doing the whole deliberation. So just okay, uh, introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, Dhaka Tribune and the Norwegian Embassy for or organizing this uh, productive uh, conversations, dialogues, and presentations here. Uh, I am Professor Mohammad Nurud Jaman, North South University. And I am also representing the Center for Policy, uh, Peace Studies at the same university. 
And uh, this event is particularly interesting to us exactly because we have already organized some 10 to 15 webinars, seminars, and round tables and discussions on the same question. And we have also shared the outputs, the outcomes of the discussions with the people in general. So just coming to the topic, uh, I was happy to see that uh, my student, Dr. Nilufar Yasmin, uh, she is talking here. She was my student at the University of Dhaka. Uh, thank you very much for your good speech. Um, starting with the moral question, uh, the ethical standards in international politics. Uh, let me tell you that there are two dimensions, two sides of international relations. One is the moral, ethical side, another is the real national interest side. Now, us usually the weaker parties, weaker states, they speak of the moral, uh, ethical standards, values in international politics. But the powerful parties, they always look after their own interest. So our ambassador, respected ambassador, was talk uh, talking about the uh, Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. So in that war, the U.S. got most of the Arab countries be, uh, behind it. Why? Because Hosni Mubarak at the time was promised $10 billion. And then Syria's Hafiz al-Assad, who was an enemy of the U.S. and also the Israel, he also got huge benefits by participating in the war against uh, Saddam Hussein. So for Bangladesh, many people say friendship to all, malice to none. I think this is very unrealistic to talk about that because everybody cannot be our friend. We are not friendly towards Taiwan because of Chinese pressure. We are not maintaining good relations even with another Muslim country, Iran, although we have huge interest there. So we cannot really pursue this particular policy, but it's good as a jargon, as a slogan only. Now let me, coming, uh, uh, let me come back to the Bangladesh issue, which was actually missing from this uh, presentation. And obviously this particular Ukraine-Russia war is not the last war. Many more wars will be coming. The first time the global crisis that, that took place in 2008, the global recession, that hit Bangladesh. Then big economies like uh, uh, Iceland, Greece, even Singapore, those economies simply collapsed. We, we were badly affected. After some 10 to 12 years, we had the COVID-19 outbreak. The onslaught was so painful that it has affected almost all countries in the world. And latest, the Ukraine war, we are now actually in a very complex situation. So the question here is, so what did we learn from the 2008 global recession, from the COVID-19 pandemic, did we uh, develop our own strategy, national strategy, to respond to such crisis in the future. So we need to have uh, real thinking about the national strategy. What should we do? How, how should we cope up with future crises like the Ukraine war? And my second observation ab about this is that foreign policy is nothing but largely the manifestation, the expression of domestic power base, the domestic strength, and in this case, it will be the economic strength. So recently we have, we are very happy that we are graduating from a uh, poor country, developing country, uh, uh, underdeveloped country to a developing country status. So that gives us a very uh, good news. But at the same time, if you look at the basic structure, uh, import, export businesses, production structure, then there is actually little uh, scope uh, to take mass uh, happiness. Because um, in the 1980s, 1990s, our slogan was to diversify foreign aid. 90% of national budget was dependent on foreign aid. In the 2010s, we got a new slogan, diversify trade uh, relations with other countries. Now the question is how much we have actually diversified our trade relations based on our production uh, structure in the country. So uh, we see that as usual from the beginning up to the present time, we have the same sources of imports, same sources of exports. Like uh, most of the time, we export to few countries, the US, UK, uh, France, uh, Germany, those countries. Uh, and please, yeah, uh, I'm please finishing, be brief, so I'm yeah. finishing, yeah. yeah. And we also import from a few countries like uh, uh, China, primarily China, Singapore, India, those countries. So we need to diversify really our sources of trade so that we are able to uh, face this uh, global shock waves uh, that might be coming again in the future. Yeah. This is not the last one. Uh, so thank you, thank Professor you very much. Uh, now uh, I am inviting uh, the British High Commissioner uh, who wanted to make some comments. I'm sure that. Thank you. I'll, yeah. I'll keep my comments quite quite brief. I hope I've got three sort of 
sections that sure, I'll address sure. briefly. Uh, first to say thank you very much for hosting this event. I think it's extremely useful to be able to discuss these things. Uh, I don't know whether there's anyone from the Russian Embassy here. It would be useful to hear from them if there was. Um, but anyway, I mean, it seems from our point of view to be very clear that Russia's uh, illegal, uh, unprincipled at aggression against Ukraine has been a catastrophe all round. It's obviously been a huge catastrophe for Ukraine. Everywhere the Russian army has gone, it's committed what now appear to be the most appalling human rights abuses, which are quite rightly a subject to international uh, investigation, and we hope punishment in the future. But I think it's also been catastrophic for Russia. They obviously expected to win very quickly in three days. They're now nine months later bogged down in a brutal land war into which they're feeding untrained recruits who are clearly being killed in large numbers on the front line. So it's a cat catastrophe for Russia. Uh, it's had the effect which clearly the Russians didn't expect of driving Sweden and Finland, who have traditionally had a completely neutral foreign policy, into the arms of NATO. Uh, and it's also, of course, had a catastrophic effect across the world, where we've seen you know, inflation and all the things that result from high energy and food prices having a very direct effect, including, as I totally see, uh, here in Bangladesh. So whatever one thinks about you know, the arguments that President Putin set out in a very strange essay that he published last year, uh, what the, the effect of the aggression uh, has been completely catastrophic for uh, U Russia itself, but also for Ukraine. And I think the question is, what does this mean for Bangladesh? And I do think the point has been made already very eloquently by speakers here that for a country with big neighbours and recently drawn frontiers, the UN Charter is absolutely essential. And uh, I think it's obviously very good that Bangladesh has been willing uh, in the General Assembly to step forward in support of that principle. I recognise that when other people in the region may have different views, it's not always easy to take these positions, but we very much welcome the two votes in favour of the uh, votes in the General Assembly that, that Bangladesh has supported. But I think it's also worth making the point that Bangladesh's wider prosperity depends in entirely on the rules-based international system. I mean, as the professor was mentioning, Bangladesh makes its living by exporting garments, basically, and other things and people. And all of those things depend on a rules-based international system. And what the Russians have done is absolutely undermine the UN Charter at its most basic level, but also the system of rules on which we all depend for our prosperity. So I think Bangladesh's interests, when you look at them dispassionately, are very strongly in favour uh, of pushing back strongly uh, against the absolute violation of the UN Charter. And we welcome the fact that Bangladesh has been willing to do that in the UN. And just finally, I think the question is what happens now. Um, <clears throat> obviously, what we all want to see is an early end to the conflict. Uh, our Prime Minister Rishi Sunak uh, was in Kyiv over the weekend, and he made clear that we absolutely unconditionally support Ukraine. We will continue to do that with military equipment. But he also made clear that any end to the conflict has to be on Ukrainian terms. Uh, it's for the Ukrainians to decide how this aggression against their country, what terms they may be willing to accept to end this aggression against uh, their country. And it is clearly not for outsiders to do that. But we very much hope, obviously, that terms can be negotiated soon, which will enable the conflict uh, to end. And actually, I think this is an interesting week because Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, who is a... Um, you know, is an exponent, obviously, of the Russian position, as you'd expect, uh, as the Russian foreign ministers be. He is actually here in Dhaka this week for the Indian Ocean uh, Regional Association. He's cancelled. Ah, that's interesting. Sorry, well, that is news to me. Well, in that case, <laughs> if Russia is represented as a dialogue partner, the point I'm going to make is that I think uh, this is an unusually good opportunity for Sheikh Hasina, who I think has a very strong voice representing... Uh, the, the oppressed parts of the world. She's done it on climate. She's done it on all sorts of other issues, including women's rights. I think for Sheikh Hasina to use her global influence to highlight to the Russians the urgent need for them to end this catastrophic war that they have started uh, would be a very good thing. If she can't do it with Mr. Lavrov, uh, because he's not coming for whatever reason, uh, then I hope she will do it very robustly with whatever representatives the Russians do put forward, uh, because she has been very clear about the effects of the war. The war can only be ended when the Russians give up, uh, and I very much hope that um, the Prime Minister will be putting forward that position as strongly as she can in a way that will enable that very strong view representing the Global South to be put back to Moscow and to President Putin, who is the one person who can end this, could end this today if he wanted to. Thank you. Uh, now I'm moving to Mr. Tabitawal. Um, still a good morning to everybody. Um, I would like to start off by thanking Dhaka Tribune for organizing this extremely important and uh, timely event. And as, o as uh, well as show our gratitude to the Royal Norwegian Embassy uh, for helping to organize this event and al also to the government of Norway for 
actually always being a good friend of Bangladesh every time we've come through some sort of political or economic troubles. Um, the good thing about going towards the end is you get to hear a lot of people, but the bad thing is that the time is always very, very limited. So I'll just, uh, uh, without any much structure, touch on three different points. First point is that, you know, Bangladesh, like any other country, you know, we can talk about being consistency or inconsistency, but I, I don't want to bark upon that too much. You know, Bangladesh, along with changing times, Bangladesh is, is uh, supposed to change its foreign policy, change its position on matters, and, um, and do what's best for the people of this nation. Now, on overall, you know, the UN allows us, or the UN Charter allows us to speak what we need, speak what we depend on, and speak what we want to do. Uh, but it also allows us to negotiate strategically. That is also another place where the UN allows us to do so. so. So to me, it's just baffling that strategically, if the Russian government is voting for Myanmar when it comes to the Rohingya question at the UN, then how can Bangladesh strategically support the Russian government on another matter where Bangladesh's self-interest is not protected, not advocated, and clearly not supported? So these are the places where you know, our questions come up and we actually have no answers. Second of all is the, um, the effect of it. So the question here is the foreign policy question for Bangladesh. It is very clear that the question of Bangladesh's foreign policy is that are we going to remain waiting and talking about more theoretical uh, issues or are we going to go into more actionable foreign policy issues? Actionable means you know, today we have economic issues to deal with. We have energy crisis to deal with. We have climate change matters to uh, really advocate for. So instead of being so dependent on multilateralism, which currently is not working, will Bangladesh move away and really get into signing FTAs? Will Bangladesh really use its geopolitical and friendly uh, position to create energy security? Which, and how do you do that? We have to have by um, state to state negotiations right now to secure energy and secure energy at an affordable price. Because we've also seen that energy plays a big part in a war. In the summertime, the Russian kind of uh, you know, negotiations was weaker because the gas was not really needed in Europe. In winter time, the Russian negotiations could be a bit harder. So, but this can change with time as well. So for Bangladesh, we have to understand that our foreign policy question is not only about the Black Sea. Our foreign policy question is that can we learn from this and quickly pivot and get into more bilateral relationships more mini-lateral relationships, which matters to us the most. When it comes to food, it's really, really, you know, the data is out there, you know. Food security is not impacted totally in Bangladesh. Grain security is. Grain security, we, we, Bangladesh used to import about 90% of its grain uh, from Ukraine. That has been severely impacted, yes. But Bangladesh has problems with rice, lentil, onion, other parts, you know, other food commodities which don't come from the Black Sea. So why are we facing those problems? Because we are clearly needing more stronger relationships with other parts of the world where their security, food security especially, can also be um, you know, uh, controlled or used for the benefit of Bangladesh. So with these three you know, outputs in mind, I just want to say that from our country standpoint of view, as general people, we are also not very sure of where we stand. Uh, I, I personally think by trying to be neutral, we're actually also being more isolated. We should be more, you know, uh, positive in decisions that we take based on, let's say, um, you know, based on issues. We don't have to have a one country-centric decision, but we need to have issue-based uh, positioning. So right now, today, our, the chair of our, uh, our, of our panel, Kazi Nabil Ahmed, member of parliament, he was extremely eloquent and direct and focused on creating Bangladesh's, stating Bangladesh's position on Palestine in the United Nations just a few weeks ago, which I read in the papers. But beyond Palestine, we are not really sure Bangladesh stands even on Myanmar, even on Russia, even on Ukraine. So issue-based, strong foreign, foreign policy positions are also the need of the time. And that, as I said, as times change, as environmental changes, that can also change. But we can't let what happened in the past affect us today. And we can't let the paranoia of what may happen in the future also affect us today. We live in today's times. We must decide based on today. Thank you, everybody, for the time you've given me. Yeah, thank you. I'm uh, Professor Tofik uh, from uh, Center for Peace Studies of North South University and Director of South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance of North South University. And uh, as British High Commissioner was saying, that it could be 
very interesting if the Russian representation was there in this room. We invited Russian ambassador in one of our, as uh, Professor Nuruzaman was mentioning, that we organized series of uh, dialogues on this crisis. And we invited Russian ambassador, Turkish ambassador, and European Union ambassadors in the same table. And Russian and the Turkish ambassador appeared, the European Union did not, and we do understand probably because they are not sitting in the same table for some reason. We, ha we published series of these policy briefs from Russia, you can work, uh, war, and I have some copies. If you're interested, you can uh, get it from the table. Just to uh, make some few points, I think uh, there is an elephant in the room, and that uh, has not been covered till now. Um, there is a geopolitical discussion, there is a kind of international relation discussion, but there is a pure political discussion also. Bangladesh is facing an economic crisis, uh, like many other countries in the world and also in the region. Bangladesh is uh, going, going ahead with the electoral crisis in next year coming. And these two crises are impacting our foreign policy. And that we need to consider. That's the elephant in the room. Without considering that two things, we will not understand why Bangladesh is taking a position and why Bangladesh is not taking a position. So as Professor Nelufar was Correctly mentioning, we did a fantastic well during COVID time, but those rosy pictures are blinking now. Those rosy pictures are no more there. We are running short of uh, uh, the bank reserves. The commodity prices are going up. Prime Minister is talking about famine. Uh, we have economists in this room. I should not talk much about economy. And then the election pressure is there from the Western countries. And uh, most of the Western, not like 2014 and 2018, the election pressures are much more higher for a credible election from more, more, most of the Western embassies and the Western powers. And then we need to understand why Bangladesh is delay dallying in a, as uh, many of you are correctly saying that, the China and Russia categorically voted against all Myanmar related resolution one after another. And still we are supporting them in all uh, foreign policy forums in the world. Still, we are depending on fully China to solve the Myanmar issue, solve the Rohingya crisis. And after this, uh, Russia, you can wear, where there will be uh, uh, donor fatigue and also the funding fatigue from Rohingya. And still, we think that China can rescue us. And China probably is also giving signals that they will rescue us from the current financial crisis. So all these things need to be in consideration uh, while we are seeing that why Bangladesh is taking a middle path or maybe tilted towards a little bit. When we are not voting against Russia, basically we are indirectly supporting uh, in the global scenario. So I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but we are in a, especially uh, the power politics is in a difficult position and that's, it's not so easy to take a single out kind of a uh, clear cut position. So. Those needs to be also considered, especially the political issues and also the current economic crisis. Thank you. I will, I will be very brief. I have uh, one comment and then a question. The comment uh, is about something that uh, Ambassador Chowdhury said. So I would like to tell Ambassador Chowdhury about a good friend of mine, a great Nigerian playwright, and I, many years ago, had the pleasure of living and working in Nigeria. And this is the story he told me. He told me the story of a Nigerian mother who raised her child very carefully to be a good man and to educate him well. And when it was time for him to go to secondary school, she had gone and purchased the uniform that he needed uh, to go to school. And there, walking along the road, a Mercedes-Benz favorite car of the elite in Nigeria drove by and splashed mud all over the mother and all over the young man, who was now standing there and covered with mud. And he looked at the departing Mercedes and shook his hand, and he said, when my generation takes over, we are going to change this, and people like you cannot do the kind of thing you just did. And the mother looked at him and said, you don't understand. 
I'm raising you so you can be one of the owners of a Mercedes. The, the comment that I, the question that I wanted to ask was, everything I have heard here is people who are living and thinking about a few years, no real historical vision of what has gone on. And I would hope that the panelists might comment on this. The prior to World War I, uh, the country, the, the globe was made of a collection of empires, some uh, colonial empires, some very large countries, uh, and the, there were plentiful wars going on in the midst of this. Uh, a period, roughly speaking, from American President Woodrow Wilson through the American President uh, 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 Roosevelt, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, participated in two wars in which all of these empires collapsed, one after another. None of them survived. The British did not survive, the Germans, the Russians did not survive, the Ottomans did not survive, the Japanese did not survive, China did not survive. The country, the world broke up into little countries. Uh, and the United Nations, for example, is a manifestation of this change. And with this came the idea that you should not attack another country. This is really a very recent idea. Uh, and it's an idea whose time, I think, the Russians have told us is finished. The United Nations, the cooperation that we have seen amongst nations is beginning to fall apart. The, uh, and if uh, I would ask the panelists what they believe, how Bangladesh should, believe, should act in a world that is clearly changing. If you think we're going to continue into the kind of free trade world that has built the Bangladesh economy, think again. The world is changing in, in really dramatic ways. And the fact that we have one country attacking another one, uh, which is kind of unusual in the last 75 years, is very likely to become more and more co uh, common. Thank you. So my name is Alicia Pradhan. I'm the founding CEO of Hernet Television, which is world's first TV for women well-being. We work for women, children, and transgender. On foreign policy, I think I will try to very briefly mention my understanding. Seems I'm the probably the youngest, so a lot to learn. Maybe on the verge of 30 is not so young. So uh, foreign policy, I want to recode our father of the nation, Bongo Bondhu, because I remember very much this year when I was at TEDx International as first Bangladeshi female on that stage. I quoted Bongo Bondhu and his non-alignment and friendship to all foreign policy, because as a youth, I believe that's the way to moving forward. Well, the world is no longer Eurocentric. So when we talk about foreign policy, it is my understanding that country's best interest must be served first. It's not about we are on Russia or Ukraine. Obviously, I detest, like everyone here, the inhuman act or the terror that has been taking place in Europe. But um, also, I think the world or the Western could have done better. When I look at our Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, I definitely vouch for her foreign diplomacy. I think in the coming years, the generation nationally and globally have a lot to learn from her foreign diplomacy. At the same time, as a youth, we want different kind of representatives. Uh, the other gentleman mentioned here that sometimes Bangladesh's stand is not clear. Well, what can you say after 200 years of oppression from the British or then again our own very uh, Pakistani brothers? So it's going to take time. When I look at India, I think they are gradually making their stand on foreign policy more strong and they're consolidating that fact. Now, Bangladeshi is a very strategically and geopolitically important country. And we are definitely the biggest contributor in UN peacekeeping. And also, we are members of very important global organization. Hence, 
as a youth of this country, I think I want to see leaders being more vocal, maybe be a bit more witty, but make sure our interests are served right. We are not a country anymore, should be cornered. Are we on Russia's side or are we on Ukraine's side? I think it is our interest that we are on Bangladesh's side because we have amazing and historical relationship with India, Japan, Russia, and US is our biggest also collaborator, including China. So uh, even Ukraine is our trade partner. I believe it's time that Bangladesh can be vocal and when it comes to question like that, can extend our own ground. Very briefly, I think I also have to touch the Rohingya issues. It is the elephant in the room for Bangladesh. Let's ask which sides are you are on to the Western, not just you know in speech, but also in big places like UN or other organization, I would like to see the Western world or even our neighboring powerhouse to be more vocal about Myanmar where there are the same massacre, there it is the same terrorism that's taking place and it's not a month or two, it's five years. We are embracing, we have embraced our Rohingya brother and sisters every please month. Please yeah, so I was saying, our foreign policy, I strongly support that, but it's not just very few key people like HPM. We would also want more leaders, like a couple of the political leaders here I truly admire, be more, mo be more vocal about our own very interest, because I would... Uh, I think it reminds me of Churchill's one quote during World War II, you know, when they say, let the brown dies, because the importance of war and weapons and nuclear power was important during that time. So Myanmar was trying to trigger war, but I think our government, our leader, has done wonderful by maintaining a peace and dialogue. That's the way it should be forward, and I hope if Europe could have done better. Maybe today Ukraine and Russia war wouldn't have taken place. The world Thank could have been a better Thank place. So you. that's that's uh, my understanding. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. I wasn't planning to talk actually because this is not an area of my uh, expertise. But a lot of reference has also been uh, made with regard to economics because we can't really separate uh, foreign policy and economic issues, uh, which was uh, quite... Um, clear from the uh, deliberations of the uh, speakers and there's nothing much left for me but I just <laughs> I would just reiterate the fact that this has this war has uh, in fact affected Bangladesh economy like all other economies and in fact it was a double whammy in the sense that on the heels of the COVID pandemic we faced this war and uh, as Bangladesh is integrated with the global economy and also we have economic relationship both with uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine. In fact, we uh, export and uh, import also. We depend on um, uh, importing fuel, fertilizer and also of or some grains, wheat. So these have had, in fact, uh, we are seeing, but all cannot be also blamed on Russia-Ukraine war that is uh, there. But what I want to emphasize that the fact, very fact that I want to echo the, uh, His Excellency, the British High Commissioner, that a rule-based system is so important. It has been um, uh, proven again and again in the context of the war, but also in the context of economic policy making and economic issues. Because when there is any uh, economic crisis, we see that irrespective of the size of the economy, economies tend to go for protectionism. And they put you know, uh, not only tariff barrier barriers, but also a lot of non-tariff barriers that makes countries like Bangladesh you know, uh, import uh, or even export very difficult and which was uh, which is being felt by not only by Bangladesh but all the other you know um, importing countries and particularly Bangladesh is an LDC and there are many other LDCs which are mainly agricultural economies and they you know depend a lot on these uh, two economies also um, along with others so that's why uh, we uh, you know this is also a, another realization that that if the global system, uh, be it the UN or many other branches of the UN, for example, the World Trade Organization, if they do not play their roles uh, properly, 
uh, then the smaller economies are uh, you know the ultimate sufferers so i think this is also a time for uh, you know raising the voices uh, strongly um, along with other countries thank you very much uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, next, uh, Mr. Umran. Oh, thank you. Um, Umran Chaudhary, lawyer and columnist, Taka Tribune. Um, so I just wanted to, po uh, we have the Parliamentary Foreign Relations Committee here, um, and so this is a bit of like a Foreign Relations Committee hearing, but so I just wanted to point out that um, I think it needs, uh, since India and China have both said in the during the G20 that they support a negotiated way out of the crisis, um, I, I think Bangladesh should step forward and uh, you know the Rupur power plant project should not get in the way because that's a commercial project that won't be cancelled by Bangladesh um, and as Jake Sullivan said they, he's the national security advisor in 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 Washington DC and he said that if um, if Ukraine uh, if if Ukraine chose to stop fighting and give up it's the end of Ukraine uh, but if Russia chose to stop fighting and left Ukraine it would be the end of the war um, and this was also mentioned by the Finnish Prime Minister when she was being pressed by reporters and she snapped kind of and she said uh, the only way to end the war is for Russia to get out of Ukraine. So uh, th I mean that's the most simplest way to put it. Um, Ukraine was a founding member of the UN uh, along with Belarus and Russia. So um, it stood by Bangladesh uh, in 1971 as part of the Soviet Union. Uh, I and, I and, and we did vote on territorial integrity in both uh, in both for both Ukraine and also in for Palestine, um, and um, uh, so I, I think we should, uh, uh, you know, we should step forward and take a more proactive approach on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being very brief. Uh, and now I invite uh, Mr. Shudip Chakraborty, uh, who is an associate professor of South Asian Studies at uh, ULEP. Thank you very much, uh, Sudip Chakravarti. For those who don't know the Bangla pronunciation of my name, uh, I am a professor of South Asian Studies at ULAB. I'm also director of uh, the Center for South Asian Studies at ULAB. Uh, and I would not presume to lecture to a room full of diplomats and foreign policy practitioners. So mine is actually a question to uh, which I put to all you ladies and gentlemen out there. Uh, I see from our conversation this morning and, and all, the, all the talk and all the commentary as well that there are many, many points of commonality in the region, uh, and when I say region, I mean South Asia, uh, in terms of food security, energy security, uh, all kinds of things, and including the effect of the war uh, with Russia and Ukraine. Now, um, is there a, and this is a question that I'm putting to the House, uh, I would really like to hear from all of you or some of you as to how uh, what is the way forward regionally because there is a commonality of interest between India, Pakistan, uh, Nepal, Bhutan, uh, Maldives, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. Uh, I'm not uh, mentioning Myanmar here for diplomatic reasons uh, about how the effects have come on from the conflict with Russia and Ukraine, grain supplies, uh, fuel supplies, Rupur, in fact, there is a Russian power plant in, uh, not, not, uh, not too old in, um, in Tamil Nadu state of India as well, with Russian technology. So there are many, many commonalities. Is there a regional way forward to deal with the Russian and Ukraine crisis? We hear a lot of chatter uh, from the recent G20, and now India is taking over the presidency of G20, so on and so forth. Is there going to be sort of a coalescing of this chatter to deal with Russia and Ukraine, uh, as this is the day's topic, and for many other uh, issues as we go forward. So I'd really like to hear from uh, all of you, or some of you about that. Uh, is there a regional approach now, which has become feasible uh, after being abandoned for so many years, to take on many issues that are global, but affect South Asia as a region as a whole, as I mentioned, from climate change to war? Thank you. My name is Francisco Benitez. I'm the ambassador of Spain. Yeah, yeah, please I, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for, um, uh, for organizing this. Uh, I have heard extremely interesting point of points of view and extremely interesting comments on different uh, aspects of approaches to the situation, to this uh, war that has uh, turned upside down so many things and principles, but we thought we were immutable. 
But one of the most interesting comments, if I may say, that I've, I've heard in this uh, discussion has been done by professor. Uh, professor who clearly said, if I, if I can remember well, that the basic principle of uh, Bangladesh foreign policy, um, uh, friendship to all, uh, malice to, to none, is not realistic anymore. Uh, and that goes in line to some other comments that I have heard here from some of the uh, 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 guests here. So my question goes to the members of parliament, members of government, and former members of government. What it should Bangladesh shift away today and how from this basic principle in an international context that more and more demands clear position when conflicts arise? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Ambassador. Now um, I'm going back to our Member of Parliament, Mr. Nahim Rajak. Thank uh, you so much. Who is also a member of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs. Please. Uh, thank you so much and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, very um, polarized discussion that we have here and across the world means I've had the opportunity to go a lot of places and I was in Sharm El Sheikh even a week back. So the world is shifting to a very polarized uh, uh, situation. Geopolitics is taking precedence. Um, Europe has had the big biggest crisis since the World War II. Uh, we as a developing nations and across everyone is affected. Now a couple of the things I just want to set straight from my end. Uh, Bangladesh in terms of its foreign policy um, um, it has had a significant uh, role playing in the global stages and hence so we have voted in favor of sovereignty and territorial integrity. So that's one of the thing and which goes by the UN Charter um, that we have all supported. So that's the fundamental part that we're sh we should actually start this discussion. And going forward, I think um, there are there have been a lot of narrative that has been drawn up here and uh, and some of them I agree and of course some of them I don't but the honorable prime minister and the foreign minister has been very clear in terms of the way forward to uh, de-escalation de of the situation in cr uh, Ukraine uh, restraints the words such as restraints dialogue peaceful resolutions have been reiterated over the over and over and again by the government of Bangladesh. So, so these words uh, does signify Bangladesh's stand on its foreign policy and specifically on the Ukraine and cr uh, Russian crisis. So that's one to go by. In terms of um, the narrative that's been drawn by a lot of um, eminent speakers and participants here, um, I do uh, agree and full heartedly I do agree with uh, the Honorable uh, His Excellency Robert Chatterton Dixon regarding how Bangladesh should proceed in 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 uh, resolving this crisis and Bangladesh has been very vocal in a lot of areas and we are a trendsetters as uh, honorable panelists has mentioned we are uh, global uh, gender uh, setters and we have shown our leadership in our own capacities in terms of climate in terms of humanitarian crisis in terms of uh, woman rights and others such and so forth now uh, where does this crisis uh, l uh, leave us in bangladesh so uh, um, uh, farmida apa has been uh, very short but very brief in terms of her deliberation tabidawal has also mentioned in terms of the economics part of it so we are all affected uh, as such uh, uh, the UK has officially gone into recession. Uh, uh, the US uh, is nearly uh, um, I is in the verge of recessions. The the global economy has been disrupted because of the uh, the disruption in the global chain supply. Now we want to see uh, a stop to this uh, conflict, which is affecting everyone. Now, how do we go about doing it? Now, when we say how do we go about doing it, we must be vocal into uh, this discussion and um, I disagree with the fact that Bangladesh is not isolated. Bangladesh and 
Bangladesh has been vocal in, in terms of his uh, or her uh, statements. Um, um, Mr. Nuruzaman, Professor Nuruzaman has mentioned in terms of his academic part of it, but the practical notions are very different. Uh, um, uh, Professor Taufik has mentioned about uh, electoral process and the other things, but I do disagree with him because electoral processes and going into election is nothing to do with the Ukraine and uh, Russia crisis. Where we stand is that we need global consensus. And in terms of multilateral approach that has been uh, stated and established in 1945, where Russia has been a part of the UN formation. So now Russia has been isolated, Europe doesn't want to engage, and the global community has been polarized in terms of its decisions. Now I'm, I'm hoping that the G20 summit that has just uh, been concluded, uh, India uh, taking over the presidency, I think we will see some sort of uh, impactful uh, decision making that will go forward. Um, and uh, with, with that note, uh, I just want to mention one or two uh, parts and then finish up because I think we are uh, lacking short of time. Um, that um, Bangladesh uh, uh, needs and wants a, a equal uh, partnership with bilaterals. So the way we are actually uh, exploring on bilaterals, uh, at the same time we want to be a part of the global multilateral approach. But unfortunately uh, the multi -ma multilateral institutions are failing in a lot of places because there has been polarization. Again, I use the word polarization because we have been seeing and, um, and uh, very eloquently Mr. Shamsir Mobin Chaudhry in his deliberation has mentioned about the historical part about the Russia and Ukraine and so on and so forth. Uh, but the polarization needs to stop. I think after the Cold War War, the end of Cold War War 1991, I think this is the biggest crisis that we are seeing in the global geopolitical scenario. So I think that's where I think we should be putting our heads down. And uh, I would expect the panelists to make it very clear in terms of a roadmap going uh, towards uh, resolution, resolving this uh, um, conflict from Bangladesh's point of view. Bangladesh is very clear in its approach. We are in favor uh, uh, of resolution. We want to see through peaceful ne negotiation. Uh, but of course, uh, the bigger and powerful uh, um, such as the Europe and America, they need to take a lead in terms of uh, making sure that the environment exists. Uh, we cannot control everyone. Uh, we have our interest and we have our national interest to look after. Uh, so hence, uh, this is a, a situation which is a very tricky situation for us and of course we are trying to do as much as we can do. I think I want to stop here and then allow the panelists or any other uh, individuals who want to contribute. And just, just one note, just to go by with it. A lot of uh, individuals here have reason, uh, raised a lot of questions about Myanmar and others. We are not dependent on China. We have reached out to the global community. ASEAN have been engaged in multiple uh, fronts. I was uh, um, there in Bali in discussion all throughout, but ASEAN did not want to take a part in this uh, conver conversation. Rather, they promoted bilaterals. So. Do, let's not lecture us in terms of we want to uh, create an ecosystem where we have to be a part of uh, uh, one side or the other because uh, the global community uh, hasn't come forward in terms of the sanctions that has been put across in Myanmar is not sufficient enough. So that's again that raises a lot of uh, questions and doubts. Uh, I, we do appreciate the global community coming forth in terms of the aids and others but that's not a solution. It's 1.2 million in a Rohingya population. What do we do with it? So these are a lot of questions that is on the table. I think uh, today the focus should be on a clear path and roadmap uh, towards uh, a resolution. And Bangladesh is very, very pro uh, engagement. So let us uh, all engage. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Nahim Rajak, for uh, raising some of the most pertinent issues, I think. Uh, with that, uh, uh, we conclude this part of the um, program uh, session now. And we, uh, before we conclude, we'll go around to the panel one more time, very briefly, to listening to them. That uh, are there some of their maybe some of their after thoughts after listening to all of your deliberations. So uh, at this stage, I will um, start with Dr. Lalifari Yasmin first. 
Thank you. Uh, does it work? Uh, thank you. Uh, it was very interesting to hear about uh, a lot of issues that came um, uh, from the from the floor, and uh, let me just uh, try to cover uh, a bit of part of it. Uh, first of all, um, a Myanmar issue. Let me start with Myanmar issue. A lot of you have pointed out why we are relying on China or Russia, given that they have helped out uh, Myanmar in in different ways. But uh, uh, which country ha is not uh, has not helped Myanmar uh, after 2017? Ask the question, and as uh, has been mentioned that uh, Bangladesh is not dependent on only China. Uh, there is a huge geopolitical game surrounding Myanmar, and no international uh, 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 you know, com community is going to shun Myanmar for the sake of regional stability. And therefore, we need to understand that Rohingya issue is something that we have to resolve with uh, Myanmar bilaterally. But at the same time, we cannot uh, uh, condemn any country for their association with, with Myanmar. In that case, we have to condemn almost the entire world for their association with Myanmar. This is something we often forget uh, to look at. Uh, number two, the question of big country, small country dilemma that has been pointed out that Bangladesh should think about it. Uh, Bangladesh is not a small country. Let me assert this and reassert this over and over again. It's the eighth largest population in the world. Compare the population of Ukraine, compa compare the population of Bangladesh. So whoever is still in 2022, uh, this November, is under the impression that Bangladesh is, is a small country. Please, I mean, uh, read and see how Bangladesh is making a difference. So when you talk about that Bangladesh is a small country dilemma, and uh, who are you pointing uh, guns at that uh, the relationship with India could not have been better at this point of time, how we have built strong bilateral relations, uh, which is institutional in nature. Um, uh, Kotilla has a very interesting dictum that it says that you know your first uh, enemy is your neighbor. But that is something we have been able to um, you know overcome in our relationship with India. We have a lot of uh, bilateral issues that are yet to be resolved, but in general, the relationship could not have been better with India. So w which big country are you pointing at that Bangladesh has this small country dilemma? Bangladesh is not a small country. And then there was uh, another uh, very big issue that uh, about non-alignment uh, movement. What we are seeing today is not non-alignment movement on Ukraine issue, but non-aligned policies. Remember, world is no longer divided on ideological uh, aspects. Rather, world is international uh, politics has moved from ideological commitment to issue-based commitment. This is something we are forgetting, and that's it. that is why a number of minilaterals are emerging on a number of issues where contradictory and competing countries are cooperating with each other. Look at HCO, the summit. Uh, Mr. Xi Jinping uh, uh, and uh, Mr. Putin, Mr. Modi is there. Mr. Modi is also also part of Quad, right? So you can see that how this minilaterals and how this kind of cooperation is emerging throughout the world because each and every country, as I began my talk with Thomas Hobbes and Machiavelli, that we are looking after our own national interest on issue-based areas, not taking you know the world uh, uh, bifurcated to ideological commitments. That no longer works. That is why the countries who were part of NAM, non-aligned movement in uh, 20th century, they were called zero plus zero makes a big zero. If you remember, uh, the former, uh, you know, uh, 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 Prime Minister of Pakistan talked about India and other countries. I, it's no longer that. 20th century's reality and 21st century's reality is extremely different. Here, countries like Indonesia is going and meeting Mr. Putin and asking to you know, uh, negotiate between uh, Ukraine and uh, um, uh, Russia. So you have to see how these countries, they have created, they have been able to create their unique voice in talking about international politics. In second week of December, we are expecting Mr. Uh, Kishore Mahabuwani to come to Dhaka, and we are eagerly looking forward to hear from him because he is the one talking about that problem that affects 12 percent of the population of the world cannot be drawn upon to the rest of the world and ask them to take a side. We are not taking any side and that is clear and that leads to that question, can Bangladesh survive with, uh, uh, you know, with its foreign policy principle that uh, friendship with all malice to none. Bangladesh has no other option but to follow that. Remember that Bangladesh will never take side. That that has been you know iterated, reiterated so many times from 1971. We have never taken any side because look at the 1971 geopolitics and within a, s a few months of Bangladesh achieving its independence, United States of America recognized us. 
and we, we, co we uh, collaborated with the uh, United States, cooperated with the United, United States of America, whereas its you know, uh, political decision was very much different, but its popular decision, uh, popular support was for uh, Bangladesh. And we have seen um, uh, Mr. Ted Kennedy visiting here uh, on the anniversary of 50 years of relationship with the United States and Bangladesh. And uh, so some of you might have seen the photo of me riding the rickshaw with him. But you, know, you, you have to see that how Bangladesh has done well in keeping its relationship relationship uh, you know, uh, well with a number of countries who themselves uh, uh, do not see eye to eye. So this is something you have to understand about Bangladesh, that we Bangladeshis are very good in keeping relationship, friendly relationship with, with all. And we don't want to bicker because it is in our national interest to keep this relationship that way. So we are not, I mean, I, I'm not talking on behalf of any government or anything, but I do not think as an academic I would support any, any option where Bangladesh would be taking side. This is something in our national interest. Um, OK, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll finish here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lailifer. Uh, now I invite uh, Kaji Nabil Ahmed to make some concluding remarks. And also, if he wants to uh, say something in response to the people around the table who uh, spoke before. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it was a very illuminating discussion. A lot of points were aired and a lot of views were shared. And uh, many different uh, issues came up that is, uh, of course, uh, good for everyone to consider. I would like to again restate my earlier point. Uh, I'm not going to like debate any particular point uh, uh, expressed by anyone, but everybody's points are valid, and we have all listened to them uh, very carefully. I would just like to st uh, again, uh, once again, say, uh, of course, we all want the end to Russia-Ukraine war, and that cannot happen with some kind of dialogue or peace negotiation, and that has to be uh, 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 that has to be. Uh, somehow fostered by the powers that are acting right now on, on both sides uh, in Europe and uh, in Russia. And I do hope uh, that we, uh, and I, I once again restate that I uh, express uh, that the most of the world had nothing to do with the, uh, nothing to do with the uh, starting of this uh, crisis uh, between Russia and Ukraine. But every part of the globe and the world is actually affected by this uh, situation right now. I do, re I do realize we all have our geographical and regional issues that we are dealing with, including our Rohingya issue, that many countries are helping us in different forums as well. Uh, many countries have come to our side with aid as well, and I appreciate all those uh, 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 friends who have come to our side. But I would like to say again that uh, the Russia-Ukraine war is affecting all of us in a daily basis that uh, no other issue is uh, affecting us. And the only way this can be resolved is through dialogue and negotiation on both sides. And some kind of terms and conditions that is ac acceptable to both sides have to be um, reached. And for that, obviously, all the multilateral organizations are from UN to European Union to other organizations and regional um, influential countries can uh, contribute to that process. And Bangladesh's future, of course, always lies in a rules-based, multi multilateral, and engagement-based uh, world, where we, of course, are uh, uh, active throughout the world uh, economically, through our trade, through uh, Bangladeshis working everywhere else. And we need, of course, a peaceful world to prosper as a country. And uh, Bangladesh itself, uh, I would like to again state, uh, state is not a small country, as uh, Professor Lailofer has said. Bangladesh is a very big country with 170 million population and a very big uh, economic engine uh, to go with it as well. And for that, uh, for the huge population that we have, our economic security is one of our top issue. And that is now being threatened because of higher energy prices and higher uh, commodity prices and inflation. That actually has not been created within Bangladesh, but has been imported from outside due to a situation that is outside of our control. And that is, of course, dictating our self-preservation and our own interest. And Bangladesh itself, of course, has historic ties with most of the countries. We have a very good relationship with the USA. We have a good relationship with the European Union, with UK, with uh, Russia, with China, with India, with Japan, with the Middle Eastern countries. Our, uh, uh, it's not that we can be friends with everyone all the time. But of course, we try to be friendly with most of the countries as far as possible to exchange our ideas, our people, our uh, commerce, our trade, our uh, uh, future to be to be shared with everybody. So I will not want to uh, take any more of our time. I would just need to say that 2023 
is a year that we need to look forward somehow to bring this conflict uh, to an end. And our Prime Minister has restated that in her different uh, speeches, including uh, her speeches in UN and other forums. And I do hope uh, that uh, the world powers that are right now in somehow in an intransigent mode, that mode can be somehow uh, made a little bit more flexible on both sides to negotiate and come to some kind of terms to end this conflict. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kaji Nabil Ahmed MP, for your very brief uh, concluding remarks. Now I'm uh, uh, inviting uh, Ambassador Tawhid Hassan to uh, give his concluding remarks. And as uh, uh, Nahim Rajak was asking for some sort of a roadmap, if you shed some li light on that, uh, what kind of a roadmap we can actually look forward to. Thank you. Um, thank you. Let me start with uh, Mr. Rajak. I'll just uh, touch upon a few points, uh, leaving most of this untouched. You know, um, global community did not come up on the Rohingya issue as we expected. Why? In my opinion, the reason is that it is only a problem for Bangladesh. Nobody else is being affected by it unlike the Ukrainian war. Um, I think I would say our, not failure, but our limitation is that we have not been able to convert it into a problem for the region or the world. Although the number of refugees is huge and it's, uh, you know, it's very easy just uh, uh, taking a few steps for uh, humanitarian aid and et cetera, et cetera. But humanitarian aid is just, uh, you know, is the, um, uh, symptomatic treatment, not going into the real issue. Uh, they are here, so let's take care of them. But the core uh, uh, problem is that they have to go back. And on that, nobody has done anything practically well. The Westerns have given some lip service. China even didn't do that. Uh, but I think the uh, issue is we have not been able to make it a regional problem. It's purely a problem of Bangladesh. Okay, um, friendship to all, malice to none. It's a rhetoric. Let us not insist on it. It is never possible to be friendly to everyone. We participated in the uh, war against, uh, against uh, Iraq. Iraq was a friendly country. At that moment, we were not friends of Iraq anymore. So, and, and that was justified. So on, on situations, you have to take sides. So you cannot remain in friendship to all and manage to learn, insist on it all the time. Um, to tackle the fallout of the uh, uh, Russian-Ukraine war, well, we have to uh, just uh, try to survive in the situation. I have one serious problem. I don't know if others also have this. Um, and the grain issue. The, the production of rice is 30 plus billion tons in each year and going by the uh, going by the 147 kilogram of rice consumption per annum per year uh, per person per year we barely need 3 million 30 million tons but then we are regularly producing more rice and again we have to import otherwise there is a crisis someone must be giving a wrong data either it's the department of statistics or the ministry of agriculture or the food ministry or maybe, maybe the census could be. Because if we have after uh, three, uh, 36, 36 million tons of uh, rice being produced, if we still need something, in that case, our population cannot be uh, 17 or 18 grow as we are saying. So someone somewhere has a wrong figure. Um, one small thing we have not mentioned, but uh, it is, I think, very important. When we were abstaining along with India and Pakistan on, on the votes. Nepal and Bhutan, much smaller countries, they went for the, they voted for the motion. I think there is something to learn there. Uh, one just small observation about empires. Well, the second world, between the First World War and the Second World War, the empires collapsed, including the British or after the Second World War, some 
the German Empire collapsed. Did the Russian and Chinese Empire really collapse? I have doubts. Russia, even after the breakup of the Soviet Union, is not a nation state. It's, it's a, they call it a federation, it's virtually an empire. China definitely is. It's uh, along with uh, Xinjiang, Tibet, and uh, Inner Mongolia. Uh, well, not Hong Kong. Hong Kong is Chinese, basically. So British took it on lease for a period, and then they withdrew. That's fine. So uh, it's just my opinion. Uh, it's not, I cannot uh, uh, go further on this. About uh, way forward, actually, I don't think that we can play any big role in stopping the war. We cannot do that. Uh, we do not belong, let us accept, we do not belong to the high, high table. Uh, we are trying to become a middle power. So this is not our time to really be, uh, think of stopping war in Europe in which uh, all the big powers are involved. They will have to find out a way uh, to stop the war and uh, go away. Uh, a very good comment there that uh, uh, stopping the, if Ukraine stops the war, it's, it's finished. But if Russia stops the war, uh, it's just stopping the war. So I would uh, quite uh, agree with this point. And for uh, Ukraine, it's very difficult to stop the war at, the, at this situation. It has to gain something, at least, if, if not Crimea, it has at least to go to the uh, Donbass region and then maybe sit for negotiations. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Ambassador Tovidusan. And with that, actually, we are uh, uh, right on time. Actually, uh, we, uh, we, co we were committed to finish this uh, roundtable in two hours' time, and we are uh, completing it in two hours' time. And thank you very much, everyone here, including the panel members and also the mm, people who came and participated. And most of you also spoke also with your giving your views just before wrapping it up uh, um, uh, uh, just my own personal two two liners maybe two three lines so that is actually wh how I see this as a uh, as a member of uh, Bangladesh society where we have been in a high growth trajectory and uh, I see this uh, conflict in Ukraine in a way, actually, um, our that growth momentum that we were going forward, Shita, uh, that one actually um, uh, has been um, actually uh, come to a difficult situation. But that then again, it's not nothing unique for Bangladesh. Other countries are also at stress in terms of economic uh, situation. Uh, as um, Kajin Abil Ahmed MP was saying that uh, we want this war to end and uh, end it in uh, through dialogue, through discussion among the parties so that uh, the whole world that has been seeing a, this is also needed as I see it that there were areas in this world which were less militarized, uh, neutral zones, and things like that, those we are seeing that being more getting militarized. That is one of the biggest fallout, I should say, that if economic uh, hardship is one fallout of this conflict, the other fallout is going more budget globally to arms and weapons and um, uh, this militarizing uh, different zones of the world. So we, uh, we want an end to this, the sooner the better. With that uh, aspiration and hopes, I'm uh, concluding this session here today. Thank you all once again. <laughs> and uh, and I, I should also uh, thank uh, the Norwegian ambassador and his team, uh, who, who has been very supportive to this uh, Dhaka Tribune initiative of organizing this roundtable. Thank you. Well, it has been a wonderful session full of information and perspectives and ideas from everyone. We would like, like to thank all of you here for participating and being with us, helping us to understand the situation and the position of Bangladesh at this point of time. 
So I would request everyone to have a good day after this and we have our refreshments outside. Please do take care of yourself. Thank you so much.